It's uh, it's 9.30, so we'll get started in about a minute or so. I think we've got quorum. Oh, Mr. Co-Chair Scott Moffitt. That S is Syracuse, correct? It is Syracuse. Okay. It's, it's stand, I've, I've said this before, so it's repetitive to all the, you know, ones and twos of viewers that we have out there, but it's a, uh, it's a stamped piece of the carrier dome roof. Oh. Yeah, Cause awesome. they, they, they replaced the roof in 2020 and then they sold off bits of it. And because like my son played in a basketball camp under that dome roof, and then we've been to a bunch of games under that roof. So it was kind of a cool thing to, to grab onto. Excellent. All right, well, shall we begin? Uh, this is our planning committee meeting today for Thursday, September the 8th, meeting number 69 of the term. We acknowledge that Ottawa is located on unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation, whose culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. Il est important de souligner que la ville d'Ottawa se trouve sur un territoire non cédé de la nation Algonquin Anishinaabe dont la culture et la présence sont enrichies et continuent d'enrichir ces terres. Kelly, can you help us with the roll call, please? Councillor Brockington? Councillor Cloutier? Présent. Councillor Curry? Here. Councillor Dudas? I'm here. Councillor Hubley? Councillor Kitts? Here. Councillor Leeper. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Menard sent regards or regrets, sorry. Uh, Councillor Tierney. Present. Councillor El Shantiri. Councillor Moffat. Here. And Councillor uh, Chair Gower. Here. You have quorum. Thank you, Kelly. This is a public meeting to consider the proposed comprehensive official plan and zoning bylaw amendments listed, listed as items 4.1, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, and 5.5 on today's agenda. For the items just mentioned, only those who make oral submissions today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the Ontario Land Tribunal if council does not adopt an amendment within 90 days of receipt of the application for a zoning bylaw amendment and 120 days for an official plan amendment. To submit written comments on these amendments prior to their consideration by city council on September 21st, please email or call the committee or council coordinator. Are there any declarations of interest today? I'm seeing none. Uh, confirmation of minutes, we're actually going to, uh, the minutes for the last meeting, we're going to deal with on September 22nd, so we can skip that item. Uh, postponements and deferrals. We have a deferral uh, 4.1 on the agenda, appeal with respect to official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment 1186, 1188, and 1194 Wellington Street West. We're going to hold this item. I know Councillor Leeper has a motion. We'll uh, introduce that motion when we come back to it. So we'll hold this item for now. Um, item number 4.2 is a development charge complaint for 1354 and 1376 Carling Avenue. And there is a deferral motion that Chair Moffat is going to introduce. This was deferred from last meeting, and I understand the applicant asked to defer it one more time. Therefore, be it resolved that item 4.2 of Planning Committee's Agenda 69 be deferred to the September 22nd Planning Committee meeting. On deferral, is it carried? Carried. Carried, carried thank you. Okay, so uh, the next item on the agenda is item number 5.1, the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment for 1071 Ambleside Drive and Bay Ward. Uh, there's a motion for deferral on this item to the next meeting, September 22nd. I believe Chair Moffat has that as well. Whereas in accordance with the Planning Act and City of Ottawa official plan, public notification of official plan and zoning bylaw amendments is required for statutory public meetings and whereas proper notice needs to be provided at least 10 days prior to statutory public meeting 
And whereas staff have identified that certain email addresses did not receive notification of the item on the agenda pursuant to the act and city policy. Therefore, we resolve that with respect to report ACS 2022 PIE PS 0095 planning committee to further report until September 22nd, 2022 planning committee. Therefore, be it further resolved that no further notice be pursuant to section 3417 of the planning act to be provided. Okay, on the deferral motion, is it carried? Carried. Carried. Carried, thank you. Okay, item number 5.2, actually 5.2 and 5.3 are basically the same address. 5.2 is a zoning bylaw amendment for 70 and 74 Nicholas Street. 5.3 is an application to alter 70 Nicholas Street, a property designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. This is in Rideau Vanier. Is uh, Councillor Fleury online with us? Because mm -hmm. I believe he has a. Um, uh, well, there's, Mr. There's, oh, hi, Matt. Uh, so there's no public delegations registered. I believe there's a technical amendment to this, and Councillor Fleury has a direction to staff. Um, let's um, let's start with that technical amendment and introduce that first. I have it on my screen. If you want me to read it. Go for it. Yes. Just make sure it's the same one. That's the direction from Councillor Fleury. Paul is chair. Uh, it was it. Do you want the technical amendment? Yeah, I was going to read that out. It's the one about uh, a revised document too. So as whereas report ACS 2022 PIE PS 0118 recommends council approve a zoning bylaw amendment for 70 and 74 Nicholas to create a new exception and to remove the subject property from the heritage overlay in order to permit construction of a 21 story mixed use building incorporating the city registry office. I designate heritage building and whereas city staff identified errors in document two details of recommended zoning therefore be it resolved that document two for this report be replaced with the enclosed revised document two details of recommended zoning. And then you were circulated. There is a there is a an addendum to the report to the motion that has the the new document to recommend the zoning. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, and Councillor Fleury, you have a direction to staff. Go ahead with that. I do. Uh, I believe it was on the screen earlier. So Kelly, I wonder if you could put. Uh, and I want to thank Tim Mark again for his. Uh, is a draft helping of drafting of wording. So this is, so what's in front of us today is those two reports and the future work on the site plan is, uh, will advance. So just giving clear direction that planning committee requests that in respect of the site plan approval for the 70 Nicholas site that staff consider uh, that the 70 and 74 Nicholas provide pedestrian access for daily Nicholas McKenzie Bridge and within the Rideau Center and that this access is presented in the app as this access is presented in the applicant's design and that the proposed design and the right of way along Nicholas Street protect the future bi-directional cycling track design that connects cyclists for uh, from Laurier to Rideau and is included uh, include and meets the needs of the future site. I believe the wording is inaccurate for the last part, but it, it, it the reflection is really that um, Zlatko, the TMP, are reviewing a bi-directional lane on Nicholas between Rideau and Laurier, and we want to make sure that it's uh, design proofed by the uh, as part of the site plan review that we're not impeding that uh, that future design uh, option. Okay, and does staff accept that as direction? Thank you, Chair. Uh, direction received. Okay, thank you. So uh, are there any requests from councillors to hold this item for discussion at all? No? Okay, I know we do have a representative from Cadillac Fairview Corporation here, Aaron Cameron. Aaron, if the um, committee is prepared to carry the staff recommendations as amended, do you wish to speak to the item today? Chair, he... Oh, good morning. Um, no, other than to just very briefly take a moment to thank Councillor Fleury and all of the city staff that we worked alongside on this file for their efforts and collaboration. Okay, thank you.
So on the uh, technical amendment that Chair Moffat introduced, is that carried? Carried. Carried. Okay. okay. And then the on the staff recommendations for the zoning bylaw amendment for 70 and 74 Nicholas Street as amended, is that carried? Carried. 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 Okay. And then uh, item 5.3, the application to alter 70 Nicholas Street, a property designated under part four of the Ontario Heritage Act. Are the report recommendations carried? Carried. 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 Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, item number 5.4 is a zoning bylaw amendment for 1649 Montreal Road and 741 Blair Road in Beacon Hill. Searville. I know staff are recommending refusal of this report. We have um, one public delegation and we have a representative from FOTEN on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I actually think we could probably uh, deal with this item very quickly right now if uh, councillors would be okay with that um, and give uh, Jane Brammer from Rothwell Heights just a chance to say a a few quick words and then I know Miguel Tremblay wants to address committee quickly as well so if everyone's okay with that it's a little bit uh, outside of our usual procedure but I think we could deal with it very efficiently here now. Um, Kelly do we have uh, Jane Brammer logged in? Yes she'd just be joining. Okay. <laughs> Jane might just need to unmute. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. I think I'm here now. Can you hear yes. me? Good morning, Jane. Good morning, Chair and, and Planning Committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm speaking on behalf of the Rothwell Heights Property Owners Association, which is the community association representing the residents in the residential zone on the north side of the subject site. We strongly support the planner's report and do not support the applicant's proposed rezoning application or its associated development plans. We agree with city planners and with the UDRP that the applicant's proposed tower height of 26 stories is inappropriate in scale and massing for this suburban location. Our concerns were outlined in a 12 page report submitted to the city on the 9th of July, 2021, during the public consultation period for this file. This report has been submitted to planning committee for this meeting and for the record. Our concerns have been based on advice from a professional planner. One major concern is insufficient lot depth for appropriate transition from a tower of this height to the abutting and nearby residential properties. The combined lot depth for this site is 76.98 meters. Significantly greater lot depth is needed for tall buildings in order to respect the 45 degree angular plane cited in the urban design guidelines for high rise buildings. We also noted the proposed development greatly exceeded the planned function of the area. We agree with the planner's report, which stated the AM zone and its subzones promote intensification while ensuring there's compatibility with surrounding uses whose planned function is to remain low rise. We further noted the nearest LRT transit stations are at a distance of 1.8 kilometers. The surrounding area has the lowest walkability score by the city's own assessment. And again, as per the planner's report, even though Montreal Road is an arterial main street and a transit priority corridor, no specific date to implement measures that will reduce the obstacles faced by a transit user has been identified. Together, these factors will result in building, future building occupants being unavoidably dependent on private vehicles. Does this fit with the city's climate change strategies and efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions when 44% of these come from vehicle use? Redevelopment of this part of Montreal Road will happen and will bring increased density and heights of buildings. We realize this. The AM10 permitted maximum height of nine stories has been judged by the city to be the appropriate vision to help meet intensification targets while still being compatible with the suburban character of the surrounding area. This is the city's vision for the planned function of the area. A 26 story tower is not part of that vision. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, Miguel <coughs> Tremblay is here on behalf of the applicant. I believe, don't see him on my screen yet, but Miguel, if you're here and you would like to address committee, please go ahead. 
There we go. Sorry, there's always a delay coming into the into the room, if you will. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning, Miguel. Good morning. Um, thank you. So I, I'll, I'll be very brief. I'm here with Rod Leahy and Tim B, but to, that they're available to respond to questions if you have any. I, I'm fully aware that my comments to the committee today are in the context of a refusal report, which is unusual. Uh, but it's that's in large part in response to an appeal that we filed for the zoning bylaw amendment to the uh, Ontario Land Tribunal. Despite staff's comments in the report, we have been fully engaged and we have provided design materials uh, and, and design studies uh, to the city. Um, and we have consistently been of the opinion that the proposal for a 26 story tower on a four story podium is actually the best design approach um, uh, for this property. You know, as, as Ted Fulbert always used to say, uh, just because we didn't do what you asked doesn't mean we didn't listen to you. Um, as I go forward, though, I, I wouldn't mind if you could pull up my presentation, Kelly, and, and go immediately to slide number seven, which is the site plan, and it'll help guide some of my, uh, my comments. I'm deliberately skipping over all of the, the policy slides. They're in uh, slide number seven, which is the site plan. But I, I do want to spend, thank you, I do want to spend a little bit of time summarizing the, uh, the designations and the policies. Given that the application was submitted in September 2021, the zoning bylaw is being considered under the uh, current and in force official plan. But I can advise the committee that the proposal for the 26 story building along Montreal Road is also fully in keeping with the council approved draft new official plan, now permitting heights of up to 40 stories given the, the width of the roadway. I wanna make a few points related to the current OP. Uh, first and foremost, despite the staff report, the entire property, which includes both lots, are designated arterial main street. There is very clear policy interpretation sections in your OP that, that, that give us that direction. Second, the arterial main street designation is a target area for intensification. It promotes compact development, mixed use buildings. And yes, there is an as of right uh, consideration of nine stories. Having said that, there are very specific policies in section 363. It's a locational criteria as to when the city should evaluate um, uh, opportunities for high rise. Given that this property is at the intersection of an arterial main street, Montreal Road is an arterial main street, it's an arterial road, and it's a transit priority corridor. Blair Road is a collector road and a transit priority corridor that does provide access to the Gloucester Center LRT station. Yes, it is 1.8 kilometers removed from this site, but the city recently um, approved, the Transportation Committee recently approved the Montreal Blair Road Transit Priority Corridor Environmental Study Report, which uh, proposed functional design changes to this exact intersection um, it, to prioritize transit, cycling, and pedestrian movements. These types of studies are in complete response to potential development applications uh, along arterial main street corridors. And I, I understand that the city doesn't have a timing for the construction of those improvements, but these are the kind of projects that incentivize the city to build those transit measures. I didn't show you the air photo because I skipped over it, but this is actually the only property at this intersection that could accommodate a high rise tower. The other properties are either too shallow, too far removed from uh, the intersection, or it's all NRC ownership on the, uh, on the west side. So in short, the, the, uh, the proposal fully meets the uh, policy direction of the arterial main street. And that includes the plan function, uh, as Jane pointed out. But I also wanna to speak to the issue of building transition because the arterial main street policies don't say you can do high rise wherever you want. It says you can do it if you transition properly to existing low rise neighborhoods. Um, so I'll speak to both the front and the back because staff took an issue with the transition uh, and the, the presence of the building along Montreal Road. But I find it unfortunate that the staff report doesn't recognize that the reason we're asking for some relief from the setbacks along Montreal Road is because we only have 40 meters of frontage and most of it is curved. So the areas that we're actually seeking relief correspond with the POPs, which is located immediately at the corner of the intersection, 
where the location of the podium and the tower fully comply with the policy direction and the zoning provisions of the arterial main street. And by the way, staff was the one who, the ones that directed us to put the pops at the, at the corner. Despite the fact that staff has some, some concerns, we're still doing a four-story podium with a one-story bump out immediately abutting the arterial main street. And we're, um, we're adding about 6,000 square feet of commercial space and the pops focused at the intersection. If you Miguel, could, we're at we're at the five minutes there. Um, if you want to wrap up very quickly, one or two sentences. So, in terms, the other issue that staff took was the transition. So, the tower setback is actually thirty-two meters from the tower from the rear property line, whereas the four-story podium is twenty-two meters from the rear property line. In in response to Jane's comments. This committee considers high-rise projects often on traditional main streets. I recognize those are more urban sites, but the average depth of a traditional main street property is 30 meters. The setback for the tower is 30 meters on this site. So the depth of this property is ideally um, Chair. For, is ideal for an appropriate transition. So in, in summary, we think that this proposal uh, meets the arterial main street policies. It provides a very comfortable transition, better than most sites, as a matter of fact. It meets the city's urban design guidelines, and we would encourage the, the committee to consider approving uh, the, the zoning bylaw amendment as per the details in the, in the staff report. Okay. Thank, thank you, Miguel. Um, Councillor Tierney, do you want a quick wrap up? You know what, uh, if, it, if it's, I'm looking at uh, committee members, I've spoken with quite a few of them. If, uh, if they approve the stack's recommendation of refusal, I'd prefer to do that prior to providing my comments. That will be very complimentary to both parties that are involved today. Okay, well, on the report recommendations that planning committee recommend council refuse an amendment to the zoning bylaw. Carried. 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 Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much, members of the committee. I will keep it very brief. Uh, I want to thank uh, not only Jane Bramar uh, of the local Rothwell Heights Property Owners Association. We had over 300 comments. We had uh, many, many people take part within the discussions. We saw uh, a, you know, a UDRP and granted UDRP is UDRP come back. Uh, with a very similar aligned comments that were not NIMBY, that were very concerned about what's happening. This association uh, does terrific work, and we've worked with Miguel on other projects in the past that have been very quite successful with Bo 10. Uh, this is just one that uh, unfortunately doesn't meet uh, what, uh, what the community scale is. I do want to thank city staff. I do want to thank, um, uh, obviously, the people that have been involved. We've been meeting for a year. On a regular basis as a subcommittee, not knowing what we were going to do. We were going to have about 30 or 40 people come in as speakers today. I'm, I'm sure members of committee are happy that that is not the case. We have actually worked closely and professionally with Jane and her crew to have Jane as a representative a spokesperson for hundreds of people within the community. And to, to uh, Miguel and Fotan, thank you for your professionalism. This has been, uh, uh, this is something that people should look at when it comes to planning applications to keep it professional, keep the discussions on pace. But I do wanna thank members of the committee for supporting the refusal of this application. Okay, thank you, Tim. And thank you to, um, to Jane and Miguel for your presentations today. We will keep moving on through our agenda. Item number 5.5 is an Alta Vista award. It's a zoning bylaw amendment for 2254, 2262, 2270 Brayside Avenue and 2345 Alta Vista Drive. There are no, um, actually there are public delegations. I missed that. So we will hold this item. Uh, there's three delegations registered. Item number 5.6 is the Orleans Corridor Secondary Plan and there are six delegations registered. So we will hold Item 5.6, and there'll be a number of uh, technical motions and other motions as well, but we'll bring, we'll introduce those when we get to the item. Um, item number six, uh, Finance Services Department, a treasurer's report on 2021 growth related revenues. Uh, there's no delegations, no presentation and no correspondence. Uh, is this report received? Received. Received, thank you. Uh, okay, so that takes us through our consent agenda. 
We will go back to the first item, which was item 4.1. This was deferred from a previous meeting on May 12th. Appeal with respect to the official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment 1186, 1188, and 1194 Wellington Street West. Councillor Leeper has a motion, and I believe we should deal with that. Introduce that first, Councillor Leeper. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, colleagues will recall, um, I guess a few months ago, the 1186-1194 16-story at the corner of Parkdale and Wellington uh, came before this um, committee. We expressed some uh, significant discomfort with the height, um, with the way in which it um, uh, is that you know that incredibly congested corner, uh, and we had a lot of sympathy for the arguments of the um, community who came before us who spoke about the vision for our traditional main streets uh, at a mid-rise height. Uh, certainly the secondary plan never contemplated a 16-story building on what is a traditional main street akin to Bank Street or to Elgin or, or some of our other uh, very thriving main streets. The uh, committee deferred this item um, and we asked the applicant to uh, start working on uh, a, a different plan, come back with something that better satisfies the concerns that I and you and the community had. Uh, but the uh, applicant instead chose to take it to the Ontario Land Tribunal for, uh, for non-decision and that has left our legal staff uh, in a position of not having instructions on how to proceed in that OLT appeal. Uh, my ask today is that we refuse the application or we instruct our legal staff to um, uh, defend a, a decision uh, to, uh, to refuse the application. And I have a motion to that effect. I would ask that it go on screen. I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me. Um, so it does not meet the intent of the official plan of the Wellington Street Secondary Plan. Therefore, be it resolved that Planning Committee amend the report to replace the recommendations with the following. One, that Planning Committee recommend that Council instruct legal services to oppose the approval of the zoning and official plan amendments sought in the appeal in respect of 1186, 1188, and 1194 Wellington West. And be it further resolved that legal services staff be directed to work with the Ward Councillor's Office to prepare a written explanation for the decision to oppose the zoning and official plan amendments for adoption by council prior to the council meeting of September 21st, 2022. Uh, I would anticipate that if this motion passes, the, the reasons that we set out will uh, revolve around our uh, clear direction as a city council, as a planning committee uh, for mid-rise heights on our traditional main streets. Um, but uh, certainly uh, I'll be working closely with uh, with legal and planning staff and developing that over the course of the next bit. So uh, colleagues, I'm, I'm urging you to um, uh, vote in favor of my motion, vote in favor of the official plan vision that we've developed for our traditional main streets at that human mid-rise scale. And uh, uh, instruct our legal staff to uh, to defend that position at the upcoming OLT hearing whenever that is. Okay, thank you, Councillor Leeper. We do have a, a representative from the applicant here, Paul Black, and uh, we have no public delegations. So um, we'll start with uh, Paul Black, if he's here on the screen to address committee. Just joining that here. And then after that, we'll go to questions for staff, if there are any. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, I'll be relatively brief. I mean, we did have a, a good discussion on this application back in May and um, uh, presented our uh, our opinion on the application, why we do think it's appropriate at this traditional Main Street location. I'll just quickly revisit those, uh, those points, uh, which are outlined in the staff report as well, which um, as, a, as a reminder, staff do support the, uh, the application as it's been presented. Um, the the traditional Main Street, as Councillor Leeper noted, uh, is generally envisioned as a mid-rise uh, street up to nine stories. But it, the official plan and the secondary plan both do uh, make accommodations for taller buildings at strategic locations. The subject property is at a major intersection. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it also has a, a fairly unique context, which lends itself to a high-rise building. <clears throat> Specifically, the... Uh, Surrounding land uses are generally institutional or commercial, uh, envisioned for a six-story or a form, generally. Um, 
And uh, the nearest residential is far enough south that an angular plane has been achieved to achieve transition into the neighborhood along Hamilton. The, the site also is located at a corner, which the secondary plan policies do specifically note as uh, potential locations for additional building height. Granted, it's up to nine stories, um, but we're relying on the official plan, uh, which does recognize uh, locations as appropriate for greater heights. Uh, through a secondary plan process. And we've completed uh, through our planning rationale and submissions, the comprehensive review uh, required for uh, amendments to the secondary plan in line that conform with the official plan. Uh, I do uh, just also want to, uh, yeah, so mention the, the mass redistribution. So the nine story form envisioned by the secondary plan has been redistributed on the site, which is what uh, has led to the 16 story form. Um, the 16 story building with six story podium is uh, generally a redistribution of the nine story form permitted in the secondary plan, which we think uh, lends itself to a better design ultimately for, um, uh, uh, for the street, for the main street, as well as for Hamilton and the surroundings. Uh, so we would uh, support staff's position and, uh, and ask that you, uh, that you do approve the application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Any questions for, uh, for Mr. Black? Okay, I'm seeing none. Uh, any questions for staff on this one? I'm seeing none. I think you've made a good case, Councillor Leeper. Um, okay, well, uh, we'll deal with the Leeper motion first then um, on refusal. So on Councillor Leeper's motion, is it carried? Carried. Dissent. Dissent. Okay, carried with dissent from Council Brockington. Okay, thank you. Kelly, is there anything else uh, procedurally uh, on this item we need to do? You're on mute, Kelly. Oh. <laughs> I turned my camera on, but not my mute. Uh, no, I think we're good, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, uh, moving on then. The next held item. I believe it was the one in uh, Alta Vista. Yes, zoning bylaw amendment for 2254, 2262, 2270 Brayside Avenue and 2345 Alta Vista Drive in Alta Vista Ward. Um, I'm not sure if we have a staff presentation on this or not. Can staff confirm or Kelly, can you confirm? Do we have a presentation for this? We do have a staff presentation. Okay, so we'll begin with the brief staff presentation and then we'll go with our delegations. Actually, and then we'll staff presentation, then applicant presentation and then delegations. And there's Kelby. Good morning, Kelby. Good morning, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, Committee. So I'll start here. So this is, as you mentioned, this is for uh, 2254, 2262, 2270 Brayside Avenue, and 2345 Alpha Drive. Next slide, please. The subject lands, also known as the St. Thomas Campus, outlined in pink, along the east side of Alta Vista Drive and west side of Brayside Avenue, which includes the St. Thomas Apostle Church, Nursery School, Brayside House, and uh, Elwood House. Next slide, please. The blue outline identifies the general location of the proposed low-rise residential expansion in relation to the entire St. Thomas, St. Thomas campus in pink. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, previous slide, please. Uh, Schedule B of the OP identifying the lands as general urban. The St. Thomas campus is identified with the blue star here. Next slide. From the new OP, Schedule B3, the subject lands are shown as the neighborhood designation with the, uh, within the outer urban transect. And next slide, please. Within the Alta Vista secondary plan, Alta Vista Drive is identified for low rise residential development, which runs along the Western boundary of the St. Thomas campus. And uh, again, the campus is identified with the blue star there. Uh, next slide. So the recommendation is that uh, planning committee recommend council approve an amendment to zoning bylaw 2008 to 250 for 2254, 2262, 2270 Brayside Avenue and 2345 Alta Vista Drive as shown in uh, document one to permit the construction of a low-rise department building 
um, as also detailed in document two. Uh, next slide, please. The supportive policy, policies, um, the application is consistent with the current OP through the general urban designation, the new OP through the neighborhood designation and Alta Vista secondary plan, allowing for low rise residential development. And that is it for me, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kelby. And we'll come back to staff later for questions. We'll go now to the, um, to the applicants for their presentation. We have Nadia DeSanti from WSP Canada and James Coliza, the architect on this proposal. We'll just give them a moment to enter our Zoom room. Good morning, Nadia. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of planning committee. Um, thank you for, um, for having us here. Um, Kelly, can you kindly um, share our presentation, please? And um, this presentation will be um, given by both uh, Jim Kalitza and I. Uh, I just wanna confirm that Jim is on. I'm here. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. So um, as, um, as presented by Kelby, 2262 Price Avenue is in Alta Vista and there's an existing photo of the existing Elwood House. Next slide, please. The uh, St. Thomas campus consists of a, um, uh, is outlined in yellow and the proposed Elwood House extension is outlined in black. So to the Northeast of the property, just to orient um, the planning committee members and the, uh, the public, there is an existing nursery school and outdoor play area to the north of the property. Um, in between that outdoor play area and the proposed Elwood House extension is an existing Brayside house, which is a group home for older adults. Then we have the St. Thomas the Apostle Church uh, to the south of that, followed by the um, St. Thomas the Apostle Nursery School. And then to the east of that is the existing Elwood House. So the previous slide had a photo of that. And at the um, southwest corner, there's uh, the Ottawa Fire Station, which is just to the south of the St. Thomas campus and then existing residential um, alongside. So Brayside Avenue is on the east and Alta Vista Drive is on the west of the property. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim Kalitza to pr uh, present the site plan, which uh, has also been overlain with the landscape plan. Um, thank you, Nadia. Um, this is an extension to an existing um, seniors apartment building, Elwood House. It's to the north and it's in the darker orange color. Uh, it is 38 um, one bedroom uh, apartments. Um, of note is that um, the extension will be using uh, the main entry and amenity areas uh, of, um, and service um, spaces such as garbage room and laundry room of the existing building. And, and I think that's, that's very important to, to note. Um, the original um, um, Albert House was built in 1988. Uh, I was a young architect, was starry-eyed architect at that time, and uh, was involved in that. Um, and the challenge back, back then was uh, putting in an institutional use uh, at that time within a, a one-story um, neighborhood and streetscape, that is Brayside Avenue. So what we did at that time is we um, put the main entry and all service entries on the interior of, of the site. And that was quite significant um, because we were able to landscape and tree Brayside Avenue almost in its um, um, entirety. And um, the extension continues that attitude of uh, knitting um, um, Alwood House and the campus really of St. Thomas the Apostle Church into the streetscape of Brayside Avenue through the soft landscaping and, and trees. So, so that was uh, very important for us back then, for Alwood back then, because we felt 
uh, that to be a good neighbor, to be courteous and respectful, uh, that we should try to knit ourselves, although we were a different form, into the streetscape of um, Brayside Avenue. Um, with regards to parking, um, um, the parking has been reorganized and um, uh, expanded a bit. So we do meet uh, the requirements for the entire campus. Um, that is all, all one, two, three, four, five, five buildings, um, uh, as well as the, uh, the bicycle uh, parking. You'll also note that all the parking is, is, is not seen from Brayside Avenue, but it's on the internal side of the site. And that's in keeping with the attitude of um, being a, a good neighbor. Um, with, with regards to vehicular circulation, um, you'll see that there are basically four entry points to the site. Two on Brayside, which are one way, one, uh, the northerly one, which is next to the dark orange, is one way in. Um, and there's currently a, a, a driveway there now that services Brayside House. And then one uh, at the southerly extremity of, Bra of Brayside, of the site, that is a one way uh, out of the site. Uh, on Alta Vista, um, at the southern end, the bottom end of the drawing, there's currently uh, a two-way entrance. And uh, at the top or south, and we're proposing an additional uh, two-way uh, exit entrance to Alta Vista. Um, the, the, the whole function of the site with regards to garbage pickup, et cetera, will remain exactly the way it is because we're looking at, we're using the existing uh, garbage uh, room. Um, with, with regards to trees and soft landscaping, um, and this is always a touchy uh, subject, um, we are removing 11 trees to, to have this um, development happen. Um, but we are, we have 37 new trees on site, we are relocating one existing tree and there are a number of shrubs. So the dark colored green on this site plan uh, illustrate uh, the new trees and the light green are the, um, are the existing trees. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and I'll be available for any, any questions. Okay, thank you. And we'll come back to you for questions after the public delegations. We have three public delegations registered. We have Kathy Monroe, Janice Horton, and Peter Hume. So first up will be Kathy Monroe. And Kathy, you'll have five minutes to address the committee. Give you a moment to get logged in here. Morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Can you see me? I'm not sure. I, oh, there. Yes. Oh. Yep, we can see and we can hear you. Great. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today. And uh, uh, just to say that I'm representing St. Thomas the Apostle Anglican Church, one of the co-owners of the property. And we are very supportive of, of this initiative. We've worked very hard with the uh, uh, with the um, Elwood Host Board and with the project team to try and, and make this extension as, um, as positive as possible, not only for the community members, for the campus itself, and of course, in support of the seniors and affordable housing, which is so desperately needed in the city. So we're very, very pleased with the the project and the site plan as it's been outlined. Uh, it's very difficult and challenging when you add that many units not to have some change, of course, to the site. And uh, But we have had community consultations and we have in fact tried to address some of the concerns, particularly over the traffic concerns for the area. So we think the project team has done a great job. So basically just to say that we're very supportive and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Any questions for Kathy? 
I'm seeing none. So thank you for your uh, for sharing your thoughts today, Kathy. Our next speaker is Janice Horton. Is Janice with us this morning? She may have to accept the prompt, Chair. Okay. Peter Hume's in the room, though, I believe. Well, let's give Janice a moment to connect here. Okay, tell you what, let's go ahead since we have Peter in, oh, there's Janice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we'll let Janice unmute. Janice, you may have to accept the prompt to unmute your screen. Oh, sorry. I got unmuted. There um, you are. Yes. Please, yes. Um, Mr. Chair and committee members, we're pleased to be here today and to thank you for your attention to our presentation. Uh, a brace, uh, Albert House has been on Brayside Avenue for over 30 years. Uh, we have been part of the community and the neighborhood, and we're looking forward to working and living with each other as we move through this process. Um, we also would like to acknowledge that uh, the St. Thomas campus is a campus that, a church and a campus that is very involved in our community. You've heard about our different programs. And uh, this summer we had a, a market. Uh, so we're very much a part of the community uh, and our seniors are very happy to be living in a neighborhood like Alta Vista. Uh, uh, I think you know how important it is that we have homes for seniors who have given so much to our community already. And uh, just to mention that we've already had um, some seniors call us and ask to be put on the wait list for the proposed uh, extension. Uh, it's an exciting project. And we'll keep in touch with the community and with the city as we as we proceed. So thank you for hearing us, and uh, and we look forward to any comments or questions you, you may have. Thank you, Janice. Are there any questions for Janice from committee members? Councillor Cloutier. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, uh, Janice and and Kathy. Nice to see both of you again, and and I just want to acknowledge. The, the time and the work of getting the project to this point, there's still work to do. Uh, we we met on this uh, prior to the prior to my election in in 2014 when I was president of of a community association. Not so much the planning issues, but the funding issues and and the project as a whole. So I just want to acknowledge the extraordinary work of of the board um, supporting Elwood House, and um, and um, my appreciation to them and their colleagues to to getting the project to 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 this uh, very important stage. That's um, those are my only comments. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Councillor, and thank you, Janice, for joining us today. We have one more speaker, and uh, it's Peter Hume. I think I recognize that name, Peter. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Well, um, I find myself in a, a unique position. Uh, I live across the street from uh, from Elwood House, and indeed, we're looking forward to this uh, this project, but introducing this type of uh, infill development into an existing neighborhood takes a little bit of, of finesse. And I wanted to just touch on one um, small point that I think they, that uh, needs some attention. And that's with the, um, the recommendation that um, the campus be one lot for, for zoning purposes. And in principle, Excellent idea, the right, uh, the right thing to do, because as your staff report recommends um, that one lot for zoning purposes will make, should make the overall site better. And, and that's important. It needs to be better. And unfortunately, some of the decisions that seem to be made, 
being made on, on the site aren't gonna make it better for uh, certainly the residents of, of Brayside Avenue. And I think uh, violate some of council's uh, directions uh, to staff. And let me give you just one small um, example of where I think this is, uh, this doesn't make um, the situation better. If you look on the north side of the, of the site plan, uh, and Mr. Pilitzer referenced uh, one of the new uh, in, in egresses into, um, into the site. Um, that's a new, that's going to be a new uh, connection to the broader site. It connects now to a small um, house for developmentally um, challenged uh, adults. It, it's quite a great place. But in realigning that, uh, that entrance to create that in and out, you actually have to cut down a mature city tree. And there's the rub. Um, quite frankly, your staff are very diligent in telling me in my professional capacity, you can't cut down city trees. In fact, the application you considered at your last planning committee meeting on Three Bassano, before I was able to bring my zoning to, to committee for consideration, I was told I had to protect that tree. And uh, I couldn't cut it down for a, for an essentially a driveway. You also you also recall that's been in the news um, seventy five Granton. We asked the same thing: Can we cut down a tree for a driveway? The answer was absolutely no. But it seems in this case we're prepared to sacrifice a mature city tree for um, a driveway. And I understand that you're going to plant more, but a large healthy, mature tree uh, replaced by 50 millimeter uh, saplings just, just doesn't really, um, it doesn't really make the streetscape better, uh, I guess, is, uh, is my point. Um, and I'm sure that you'll hear, and, and when I was in your position, I heard it too. There were a million reasons why things couldn't happen, why you, you had to do it, why you know, it's, whether it's emergency vehicles or, oh, you know. And I think in this instance, when you're creating uh, one lot for zoning purposes, for the purposes of making the streetscape and the site plan better, you, you shouldn't um, give in to those sort of, I guess, standard excuses. You should actually be saying to the applicant, listen, you got to do better. You, you need to um, you need to protect those, those assets. And, you know, we all follow city council's decisions, you know, the 40% tree canopy, uh, the climate emergency, um, you know, the, the big focus in the new OP on uh, the urban forest. Um, and I think that has to apply here. So, uh, Mr. Chair, if you're going to approve, and, and I, I think you should, I think you should approve the, the zoning. Uh, if you're going to approve one lot for zoning purposes, you really should give some clear direction to your um, to your staff that we're going to approve this, but in approving the site plan, no healthy city trees, as identified in, in the documentation that the applicants provided, should be cut down to facilitate this development. And I think I think that you know we're willing to the neighborhood's willing to accept some, you know, to accept the development. Sure, welcome it, embrace it. But you know what? You need to take a couple of steps to make things better for the for the residents to live along Brayside Avenue. And and you know, I could I could talk about whether the access is really needed, either access on Brayside Avenue is really needed. But you know, Mr. Chairman, for uh, for the purposes of, of this discussion, I really just think that you know a statement from a planning committee that says, you know what, um, we, we recognize you're going to uh, plant a bunch of trees, but we just don't want you cutting down healthy city uh, trees. And, and that's what I would uh, encourage you to, direction I'd encourage you to give to your staff. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Any questions for Mr. Hume? Councillor Leeper. Thanks. And uh, Peter, good to see you. Um, can it be done, like, if you are uh, taking a look at this site plan and you don't want to lose a mature tree, you don't want to lose units of housing, um, is is there a design that you 
see on the table that would uh, that would work? Well, you know, there's always a design that will work, right? They, they've, uh, you know, the entrance is now uh, three, four meters wide. Uh, could you curve that entrance to protect that tree and utilize the, the existing entrance? I, I think you could, um, because right now the entrance to the parking lot of that facility is curved around that tree. I, I don't know why you can't use that. Um, you know, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear that the, the private approach bylaw and, and there's, every, there's any number I'm sure of regulations that might say you can't, but uh, I think you can. I think a little creativity um, is, is what's uh, needed here. And um, whether it's a smaller, maybe, it's the, maybe it needs to be three meters or maybe, you know, no. which is the size of, of driveways in, that you will see in your neighborhoods. Uh, I certainly think it can can be done. I mean, I'd love to to think that the the applicant would go back and ask, do they really actually ever need these accesses? Because I think you could create a, a beautiful tree lined streetscape uh, along Brayside, and that would be a benefit. But you know what? That that ship has probably sailed uh, because we do have an existing one that works quite fine. So, but I think it can be done. Okay. And thanks. Yeah. Just to follow, your staff often tell tell applicants, like, look at, find a way to protect that tree, and you know we do. Um, you'll see hopefully in the near future one that where you know no one thought we could protect the tree, and and you're doing that because you've been because you've been given clear direction by your staff. You got to go find a way to protect that tree. No, I appreciate your optimism, and uh, and we know that you uh, have considerable expertise in this. So I, I imagine that uh, Councillor Cloutier will uh, uh, probably want to uh, take some action with respect to uh, your um, your encouragement. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and um, thank you, thank you, Peter, for your always thoughtful and productive uh, comments on on city planning files. And and yes, we. Uh, we did speak yesterday, uh, he and I, you and I, Peter, and um, I've exchanged with staff and I apologize, there's a, a phone going off. Um, spoke with staff yesterday and they are going to propose a, 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 an option that that um, does look to saving that linden tree that Peter is is referring to. And so when we get to to staff, I will I will be uh, providing some direction. Uh, to adjust the design to um, at site plan so that um, the, the policies that Peter was referring to, the importance of trees, of mature trees, and, and the responsibility of developers and development to preserve those trees is, is respected. So, Peter, thank you for um, your intervention. My pleasure. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Clute. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today. We will turn now to any questions for the applicant from committee members. Are there any questions for the applicant? I don't think so. Okay, any questions for staff? Councillor Cloutier. Uh, I'd be happy to let uh, Councillor Brockington uh, ask first because I will, um, I don't have questions. I will have direction and wrap up. Chair. Okay. So Perfect. as you see fit as Perfect. Councillor Brockington, you're up. I think Councillor Cloutier may be going down the same road that I'm thinking, but it's I want to get staffs um and John, I'm not gonna steal your thunder, but I'd like staff to um comment on the tree matter. Is it possible to uh, save the tree and and uh design or redesign the driveway to make the project? successful and feasible, but also retain the tree, which should be a, a main priority. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, this, uh, the, the, I'll just note that the, the, any uh, approval for any tree removals is done through the site plan. So it, that is a, a few steps away still. Um, the alteration to the access to the site and protection of the trees is something that has been um, discussed. There are some concerns as far as um, maneuverability of, of larger emergency vehicles or, or um, servicing uh, in the area, underground servicing. 
Um, so it is something that uh, um, I am discussing with the applicant and, um, and uh, I, that's uh, all I have at this moment. Okay, I'm, I'm interested to learn in the direction that Councillor Kluge is about to put on the floor. I'd say that um, when we approve zoning separate from the site plan, meaning when they're dealt separately and there's a, a matter of time in between both, sometimes projects get so far advanced that when you raise objections during the site plan, it's almost too late. So I think it's very important today for the committee to make a statement and says, yes, we're willing to approve this application, but here's our expectations in particular with the tree. So I'll yield the floor to the, to the local counselor because I think he's going in this direction, but I think we have to be very clear today that we want to retain this tree, um, whether it's part of site plan or not, that this remains a priority for us. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cloutier. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and, and thank you, Councillor Brockington. Uh, yes, certainly at, at the consultations, we, uh, we, we, we did discuss uh, entry and exit and, and parking on the site and, and uh, unit configurations, timelines, and we absolutely discussed the environmental impacts of this and, and uh, of the construction and, and the impact on trees. I do not recall focusing on this specific tree, but it, it has been highlighted, and, and I appreciate that. Um, it, it is a linden tree. It is over. It is a, a city tree. It is a healthy tree, and so it it should be um, it should be preserved. And I would encourage staff to preserve, and uh, and I appreciate the the discussion I had yesterday with Kelby uh, on this. Um, and so, uh, Chair, is it good to provide direction now? Uh, because yeah. I have no questions. Uh, I will only have just very brief closing comments. Would you like me to do that now, Chair? Yes, please go okay. ahead. Okay. So, uh, I would like to provide a direction to staff that um, they explore in, in um, a, a diligent and a, a fruitful way uh, all the ways at site plan that to see that no healthy tree, no healthy city tree um, is be removed to put in a laneway for the simple sake of a laneway. I don't know if that's um, comprehensive enough or clear enough for, 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 for staff. Um, that would be my direction. Okay, would staff accept that as direction? I receive, thanks. Yes, Chair. And I will also point out that this, um, I, I believe, uh, Kelby, correct me if I'm wrong, or, or Lily, uh, that this does, uh, site plan can't, does require councillor concurrence uh, because of when the, because of the timelines, it is not uh, subject to the new um, site plan control provisions of the new provincial bill. I, I think that's correct. Is that not right? That's correct, Councillor Chair, and that will make sure the Councillor's office is well um, informed of the uh, resolution with regards to this matter. And then we'll, we'll be, we're committed to be creative and explore different ways to achieve that objective. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Chair, okay. I have no, I, I think I have the floor. I, I have no other yeah. questions. I don't have any member questions. I don't see any right now. Uh, do you want just- No, if you want to wrap up, uh, Councillor. All go, right. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, well, Elwood is, has been part of the community for, for a long, long time, as you've heard, and I heard about it uh, quite a while ago, and I sure do appreciate the commitment in this context of the board members, volunteer board members, um, to provide additional uh, low cost senior elderly housing in, in this uh, wonderful community in, in this wonderful uh, setting adjacent to the church complex adjacent to the church and and in, in the community of Alta Vista um, been a valuable member of of, um, of our city for over 25 years and and I 
the collaboration with the Anglican Archdiocese to provide over 30 homes, new homes, um, is, is appreciated. It's been a long time coming. Uh, again, not so much because of the planning aspects, but funding aspects. And I know that's not the purview of this committee, but I just want to say as a city, we need to do better to, to bring these projects to support the the, the uh, residents, the organizations um, like the Elwood House Board who want to provide uh, new housing for, for, for people. So I, I leave that to my, uh, my successors. Uh, and, and so uh, those are my comments. Uh, I, I, uh, I support the proposal. Uh, we had a lot of, uh, we have consultations and, um, and, and the community has been kept informed. And, and what is proposed today, notwithstanding the treat, what is proposed today has been adjusted based on uh, some, of the, uh, some of the comments that we had heard in the past few years as this was coming to fruition. And so I would respectfully request my council colleagues to support the applications, to support the staff recommendation uh, and, and move along uh, on the zoning for, for this property. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So uh, the report recommendation is that planning committee recommend council approve an amendment to the zoning bylaw for this address as shown in document one to permit the construction of a low rise apartment building as detailed in document two. Um, so are the report are the staff report recommendations carried? Carried. 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 Okay. Thank you. So we'll Thank move you. on to the next item that we held, which is item number 5.6. The Orleans Corridor Secondary Plan. We do have uh, Robin Vandeland here who uh, will have a presentation for us. This spans two wards, Orleans Ward 1 and Innes Ward 2, although those would all get mixed up as of November 15th. Um, there's a number of technical motions and other motions, and we do have six delegations. So I think it'd be best to introduce those motions right at the start because some of the delegations may wish to address those. So before we even get to Robin, um, I'd like to go, let's start with our technical amendments to begin with. Um, I'm not sure how many we have. So Kelly, I'm, I'm in your hands in terms of making sure we, we get through all of the motions. We'll, we'll go with the order that Kelly has them on the screen here. And Co-Chair Moffat will introduce any of the technical motions. Thank you. So whereas proposed secondary plans as written include a policy on marine clay and whereas the new official plan sufficiently addresses when technical studies are required in relation to sensitive marine clays, slope stability, and retrogressive slope failure. Therefore, be it resolved that with respect to report ACS 2022 PIE EDP0024 planning committee amend document one section 4.15 as contained on page 20 by approving the following. One, deleting the word policies from the title of the section. Two, in paragraph two, by replacing the word and immediately following the words address sensitive marine clay with a comma. Three, in paragraph two, by adding the words and retrogressive slope failures, immediately following the words slope stability. And four, delete policy one as contained at the end of section 4.15 in its entirety. Okay, thank you. And another technical motion. Whereas the station core designation in the Orleans Cor Corridor Secondary Plan is intended to be the focal point for services and amenities in the vicinity of O train stations, and whereas the intent of Section 5.15 is to provide for active ground oriented frontages along streets through residential retail or a mix of complementary uses, and whereas Section 5.15 includes a test that introduces a necessary complexity that does not contribute to the desired outcome. Therefore, be it resolved that with respect to report ACS 2022 PIE EDP0024 planning committee and amend document one, section 5.15, by approving the following. One, delete the second sentence in section 5.1, policy five. Okay, and is this a third technical amendment? I think so. Yes, whereas uh, an error has been identified in the Orleans secondary plan that resulted in a number of residential properties along Jean d'Arc corridor as incorrectly subject to a maximum height schedule, therefore be it resolved with respect to report ACS 2022 PIE EDP 0024 plan committee to replace document three schedule B Orleans corridor maximum building heights with the attached schedule dated September 8th, 2022. Okay. Um, and there's the attachment, I believe. Are there any other technical motions? 
I know not Councillor. To my, not to my knowledge, Chair. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Councillor Dudas has one and perhaps two motions. Just one. Just one. One of them was uh, the technical amendment. Perfect, so I'll read this. So whereas the Orleans Corridor Secondary Plan seeks to modernize and intensify residential and commercial development along St. Joseph Boulevard in line with the new official plan, whereas many of the properties along St. Joseph uh, but existing predominantly two-story established neighborhoods, whereas intensification must fit with and respect the existing char character of established neighborhoods, and whereas policy 6.6.6 .6 of the new official plan directs development to provide transitions between low, medium, and high dense, high rise development in order to allow for sensitive integration of new development and policy 4.6.61 directs the new zoning bylaw to include transition requirements. Therefore, it be resolved that the planning department be directed to seek transition requirements consistent with the new official plan policies and applicable design guidelines when reviewing any application of a mid or high rise building on St. Joseph prior to passage of the new zoning bylaw and that the new zoning bylaw include a review of transition requirements between the neighborhood designation and mid high rise development on St. Joseph. Okay, thank you. Sure. Are there any other motions on this item? Chair, I'm just wondering, um, Councillor Dudas uh, has introduced a motion. Um, there was no uh, uh, precursor to it or, or sort of discussion about what it accomplishes. I don't know if it would be appropriate to uh, just provide a moment or two to uh, just discuss what that motion is intended to accomplish. Yep, for sure. Councillor yep. Dudas? Absolutely. I absolutely would love to to share some, some background on this. So, a lot of the work that has gone into this plan is, is absolutely in consultation with the community. There's been a lot of efforts done by our amazing staff on this. What this does is just reminds staff that as applications come forward, that as per the official plan, that we're looking at setbacks and step backs appropriately in conjunction with the abutting residential or commercial developments. So it doesn't change or um, it doesn't make it so that we cannot have the heights that are outlined in the plan. What it does is it, it takes into consideration the need for transition. And I'm dealing with a situation very similar to this in one of my communities where that wasn't taken into account when the zoning was changed and now there's very, very, there's very, very uh, divisive feelings on that particular thing. So what this does is it brings it back to the forefront as staff are considering applications to once again determine does this fit in the context of the official plan? Does it fit with the secondary plan? And then does it work with the abiding community? And how can we make that transition applicable? Thank you, Councillor. And we will come back to uh, the motions afterwards for any discussion with staff or counselors. So we will proceed now with the uh, presentation. Robin Vandeland is the lead on this. Good morning, Robin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I do have a presentation. So on behalf of the uh, uh, community planning unit, we're really proud to bring forward this uh, the secondary plan. Uh, this is our first secondary plan issued under the new official plan. Although we are awaiting uh, ministerial approval, we have the five big moves and the new and the new official plan and the directions within it that are consistent with the provincial policy statement. And uh, we're very proud to bring this forward to you. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my team members today. I have with me today uh, Peter Giles, uh, Tavi Sitam, uh, David Maloney, Jocelyn Cadeau, and uh, Peyton Hofstetter. And uh, I also have uh, Nick Stowe with me today. The next slide, please. The uh, vision for the secondary plan is to provide intensification and revitalization to create compact, walkable neighborhoods centered, centered around the O train stations and St. Joseph Boulevard. Next slide, please. Uh, emerging out of the five big moves, we've uh, established a number of goals within the context of the Orleans corridor. They are 15 minute neighborhoods, development around rapid, uh, development around rapid transit, enhancement to the public realm, parks and green spaces, uh, prioritization for mobility of pedestrians and cyclists, and coordination of new built form with improvements to the public realm. 
next slide. We were very gratified with the, with the amount of public uh, input into this particular plan. We had three open houses. The first one was, we had I claim close to 300 people attend at the Shankman Center. It was quite something uh, just prior to the pandemic. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, we've had two open houses online. Each was attended by more than 150 people, which is really terrific. The things that we heard at the at the open houses were uh, actually quite consistent with what we heard during the official plan review. People, uh, people were very interested in walkability, a mixture of uses, good design, public realm and the environment. These are all really worthy, uh, really worthy aspects for the, the secondary plan and would really enhance uh, Orleans and the corridor. Next slide, please. So what we've proposed is to promote high density mixed use developments on underutilized property in proximity to the O-Train stations in St. Joseph. Uh, we would like to support a range of economic activities, including light commercial and light industrial uses along and, and within the corridor. Uh, we seek to build new and improve existing pedestrian and cycling connections to the stations and to the main street, and to provide an exceptional public realm to encourage walking and cycling across the town center and the main street areas. Next slide, please. I will just go over this fairly quickly. This is the designation plan. Uh, there is uh, not too many changes since the technical circulation. I don't really want to draw your eye to too much here, but we're here to uh, answer questions relating to the designations. Associated with this, uh, associated with this schedule is, uh, the next slide please, the uh, maximum height schedule. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the light blue areas on, on St. Joseph. Uh, we, the, the technical motion that we brought forward, there is a number of existing neighborhoods uh, that we realized uh, we did not intend to put uh, new maximum heights on if we're requesting the withdrawal of those. That's consistent with, those are consistent with the lands that are uh, being redesignated on the previous schedule. Uh, the next slide, please. A key feature of this plan is the public realm and connectivity. What was really important, we heard very early on, is not only were these stations going to be built, these four stations in Orleans, but there's a, we, had, we always had a high, a high use of transit usage within this area. So it was critical for us to ensure that we didn't wall off or didn't create a condition where we were walling off station areas and that existing neighborhoods would, bene, uh, would also benefit from uh, redevelopment uh, through uh, new connections to the stations. Next slide, please. I'm now going to go to my colleague, Peter Giles, to speak a little bit about our flagship part of the plan called St. Joseph. Thanks very much, Robin. And uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about our plan for St. Joseph Boulevard. One of the most important parts of this plan is establishing a vision for the transformation of St. Joseph Boulevard into a true pedestrian-oriented main street. Ce plan vise transformer le boulevard Saint-Joseph comme rue principale qui priorise les piétons. Recommendations to transition Saint-Joseph into a more multimodal street with various streetscape improvements have been around for nearly 20 years, starting with the 2003 CDP and a 2009 streetscape strategic plan. With the arrival of the O-Train in Orleans, with stations one block north of Saint-Joseph, and with the new OP and its, and its emphasis on intensification, sustainable transportation, and 15 minute neighborhoods, now is finally the time to confirm this vision for a complete street for St. Joseph Boulevard. Avec l'arrivée de l'eau train et du nouveau plan officiel, c'est finalement le temps d'avancer la vision pour une rue complète pour St. Joseph. We believe that these public investments in St. Joseph Boulevard are critical to attracting intensification in this corridor. Once we have a complete street on St. Joseph, that's an attractive place to live, to work and to shop, we're confident that it will unlock the private sector response, response with new development that will bring permanent jobs, residents and services to support 15 minute neighborhoods. 
Tout simplement, investir dans le boulevard Saint-Joseph amènera l'intensification qu'on désire. So how does this plan establish this vision and how do we move forward towards implementation? Next slide, please. One of the recommendations of the report is to approve the vision for this complete street. That's outlined in the secondary plans document one and in, the, in Annex B, that's the St. Joseph Boulevard concept plan. You'll find that in documents 6A, 6B, and 6C. The concept plan was prepared by Parsons in collaboration with city staff. This involved an internal technical advisory committee that included staff from multiple departments. The study by Parsons included a detailed traffic study. As a result of this analysis, the recommendation is to maintain a four lane cross section west of, Saint, of Jeanne d'Arc Boulevard, where traffic volumes are highest, and move to a three lane cross section east of Jeanne d'Arc Boulevard. The rendering we see in the screen here is an example of that. This provides space for wide sidewalks, cycle tracks, a wide boulevard with street trees, transit shelters, street furniture, and also leaves space for transit priority measures such as two jumper lanes. Now, besides this ultimate condition, the concept plan also includes plans for an interim condition where curbs would remain in place and the number of lanes will be re reduced from four to three and minor street modifications would be introduced in order to accommodate cycling facilities. While the concept plan is really quite detailed, it still needs a functional design plan, which is an even more detailed transportation study before these plans are shovel ready. Funding for implementation of either the interim or ultimate condition is expected to be sought through the transportation master plan. That wraps up our presentation. We're happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter and Robin. Uh, we will come back to you after the delegations for questions from committee. So we have six public delegations. Each delegation will have five minutes followed by any questions from committee members. First up is uh, Tony Provenzano. Good morning, Tony. You'll have to accept a prompt there to unmute Tony so we can hear you. There you go. Oh, good, good morning again. Uh, uh, thank you for the committee for allowing me the opportunity to make some comments today. I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Luloff and staff for uh, working on this. This has been uh, somewhat of a larger exercise given the fact that it's a, it's a larger secondary plan that I guess we had thought about, but it's uh, encompassing the whole, the whole broadband area. Um, some of the items that, that are in the report that I received, uh, identify six distinct areas. Um, and they identify the four stations that are currently being built, Jean d'Arc, Covenant Glen, Place Orleans, and Trim. Um, there are two GO stations that have not been identified in the secondary plan, which I believe should be identified because this secondary plan is a long-term document. It's, it will be in place for 20 years, 30 years, as the last one was. Um, and the, the Tenth Line uh, Station is important because the Tenth Line Road is a major arterial road that brings in traffic from Navin. Uh, it, it's, it, it is actually, in my opinion, a better 15-minute community than Place d'Orleans because it has access to the Ray Friel Community Center uh, and the police station is actually right across the street. So it does have some significant areas. It's actually also halfway between the trim station and the uh, Place d'Orleans station, which makes it that you can walk with, between those two stations. One of the other aspects in, in the secondary plan is, is the identification of economic development. Um, the the secondary plan focuses on the town center being located at Place Dordian Shopping Center, um, which, which doesn't really work because given the town center idea, you have to put 10,000 jobs on that site. And that's not, in my opinion, that's not gonna work very well because the shopping center is gonna remain a shopping center and you may see some residential towers off it, but I don't suspect that the economic development 
will be supported by that station alone. And that's why I believe more so that maybe the 10th line station could do, could do some of that work for the 10,000 jobs as well. Um, and, and create possibly because it's a vacant land opportunity, uh, create buildings that are newer, that pr uh, provide climate change, that has a direct station connected to the buildings, um, and that can bring a lot of economic development to Orleans, something that's been uh, highly sought for, for the last 20 years as I've been involved with the Orleans Chamber of Commerce in the past. So all being said, the two points are, I think 10th line needs to be included in, in this secondary plan uh, as a station of the future, and it should be identified. And secondly, the economic development needs to be reinforced and supported. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Any questions from committee members for Mr. Provenzano? Oh, I'm seeing none. Thank you for your presentation today. We will move on to our second speaker, Denise Menard. Yes, hello. Oh, good morning. Oh, hi. Yes, um, can you see uh, the owner besides me? We only see you right now. Okay. okay well. Okay. I'm there. I'm Denise okay. Menard. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, we, uh, Denise, uh, the owner, and her two sons, which is me, Dennis, and Stefan, besides me, are the Menards family uh, living in Nazareth. Uh, we are reaching out to you today to discuss the land we own at 8899 Jean Dac Boulevard in Orleans. The land was purchased in 1960 and extended from the Ottawa River up to Highway 174. We thereon built our farm and began our livelihood. Over time, in 1963, the Carillon Dam was constructed and raised the level of the Ottawa River and flooded a portion of our land. This impacted the farm and its operations. We are not happy with the consequences of the flood. In 1987, a second expropriation occurred and covered the majority of the land and farm. The family was not happy again. The expropriation gave road access to what is Brazil's development to the east and for a proposed overpass and interchange on Trim Road, which never happened. The land is being currently being used as a stormwater pond, and there appears to be surplus land on the east side of the property. The province demolished the houses, the barns, the buildings, and significantly affected our livelihood, as we had to start over with the limited funds we received. We were completely devastated. We had to search for a new place to stay. The city of Ottawa is again planning a third expropriation on a portion of the remaining land. We, not, we are not happy this is happening again. And we are here today to voice our concern. We believe that this expropriation is not appropriate since our neighbor to our immediate west has a similar drainage feature and they are not being expropriated by the city of Ottawa. Further, we are willing to work together to find a solution for a win-win situation. Furthermore, to add to our disappointment, the city is proposing a change in the designation of the land from DR, which is Development Reserved, to EP, Environmentally Protected. The city never informed us of this proposal. We have asked for supporting documents for this change and we have received no answers yet. We have 62 years of knowledge of the land and we disagree with the intent of the city of Ottawa regarding our land. We request the city to review the expropriation and let's work together in finding a solution that works for both parties. In addition, we wish to have a, the DR zoning remain and our designation be similar to those of our neighbors. My, uh, the owner, Denise, would like uh, to add a few words. 
Oui, bonjour, je suis Denise Ménard. Je suis propriétaire de la propriété 88-89 Boulevard Jean d'Arc depuis 62 ans. Je suis très déçu des plans de la ville d'Ottawa de changer le zonage, tel que mon fils a mentionné tantôt, sans nous consulter, sans nous donner du temps pour vérifier. Maintenant, les propriétés à l'ouest et à l'est de la nôtre sont une en construction et l'autre bientôt. Alors, je me demande pourquoi que la nôtre, on veut changer la, le zonage. Alors, je vous remercie de votre temps et bonjour. Merci. Thank you for your time. Okay, merci beaucoup pour, pour votre présentation. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions du comité? OK. Merci beaucoup, uh, Dennis et Denise, pour votre présentation. On continue avec notre uh, prochaine délégation, c'est Marc Poirier. Marc Poirier, you're up next. Good morning, Marc. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So um, I'm I'm actually uh, here to um, uh, compliment what uh, Denise and uh, the family just said. Uh, we have an agreement with them to uh, to purchase it to develop, um, and of course, it's all dependent on uh, what occurs here. But um, so um, if you could uh, please go to the second slide or to the next slide. So the official plan, uh, as they said, uh, currently uh, is, um, um, is designated as a, a DR zoning, and uh, we want to keep that DR uh, designation. And um, it's um, the same designation as uh, the west um, of the property. And as we know, the east has already uh, been building um, on it. The proposed um, official plan is to change the DR to environmental protected zoning. And, um, and of course, uh, they've mentioned the deficient uh, notice uh, on this. Next slide, please. So this is the location. You'll notice that uh, the green, um, which is a little difficult to see, but it, it is identified as a, as a A, um, is the uh, site in question here. You know, there's two parcels. And um, on uh, the um, right side of that, you see a blue B section, which is actually the Brazil, uh, which currently has three towers and uh, three future towers. Um, on the west side, so on the left side, we see C, which is what is currently in front of, um, of uh, the committee uh, to uh, approve um, a four uh, future towers, and that's uh, by the Chenier, um, I call it the Chenier project. But I also want you to, uh, to notice the expropriated section that uh, the Menards have uh, mentioned, which is right in front. It used to be their land, but it was expropriated. And, um, and so I'll get back to that a little later. Um, the yellow, as you see, is what's currently zoned DR currently. And so uh, and you also notice the LRT. Um, there's a little round spot with the LRT on it. That's where it's currently being built in front of the uh, Chenier, if you will, uh, property. Uh, next, uh, so uh, per, yeah, okay, that's fine. So um, on uh, the east side, uh, this is the Brazil site. And so you notice that there's three buildings. Uh, currently, they're finishing the 2022 building. Um, and um, in the future, they have three more towers that you can see surrounding it, um, whether beside or in front, of, in front of the buildings. Next slide, please. So this is the Chenier site. This is the east side of the property. And we can see that there's actually four towers that they're proposing. And I want to bring your attention to the blue um, uh, arrow. It's showing where the culvert is currently, and uh, that's for the storm water drainage. And, um, and of course, they've proposed a tower uh, to, uh, to be there and to control the, the drainage. Uh, um, so the, the south side um, of the um, Jean d'Arc uh, Street is completely engineered. And so um, I suppose uh, Chenier is uh, offering an engineered uh, solution on the north side uh, to accommodate it. 
Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, kind of a view uh, if we were to, uh, uh, to build uh, the two towers that we are interested in, in, in building. Uh, from the south, which is the top uh, view, we see uh, what I showed you earlier about the uh, Brazil site on the right hand side and on the left, uh, it's showing three, but it's actually four towers that they want to do. It's an older uh, picture. And if we look down at the north view, oh, that's uh, looking from the north side, we're looking at the buildings and we can see again the Brazil on the left, we see the Chenier three towers, which, which uh, they're presenting four towers on the right, and the two that would be um, proposed uh, on our site right here. Next slide, please. So this is the LRT station that is uh, currently being built, and this is in front of the Chenier. Next slide, please. You have 30 seconds, Mark. So this is a proposed um, uh, official plan designation, and I'd like to bring your attention to the red um, sur uh, square. Uh, that's where it's currently DR, and you'll notice everything around it is uh, identified 40 stories. And, um, and of course, part of that is where the expropriation uh, was done uh, years ago in front of it. Uh, next Mark, slide, please. You're at time, so if you can just wrap up with 10 seconds. This is the expropriation. Um, um, so this is the plan from the city that shows the pond uh, where the trim road is, where the Jeanne d'Arc uh, road is. And uh, you'll notice on the bottom part, uh, there's um, where the water is being um, uh, drawn to. Uh, and of course, there's no expropriation being identified there for the Chenier site. Mark, but I have to stop you there because the, we are uh, over the five-minute uh, limit. They are uh, asked Mark? looking for an expropriation. Whoops. We're, we're, you're over your five minutes, Mark, so I have to stop you there. I will go to committee members if they have any questions for the delegation. Oh, now I can hear you. Sorry. I missed okay. what you said. You were over your five minutes, and there's no council oh. questions, so I have to stop you there. Uh, but we will, when we get to questions for staff, we will get staff to clarify, because uh, I think some of these items are outside of the scope of the secondary plan in front of us, but we will get staff to comment on this later on. Um, we'll move to our next speaker or speakers. Uh, we have Adam Thompson, Murray Chown, and Jeff Pablo from Novatech presenting together. I see Murray. Good morning, Murray. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chair. Um, I will be presenting... Uh, Mr. Thompson is here with me. Mr. Pablo, who is from the Myers Group of Companies, isn't available this morning. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, I'm pleased to appear before you on behalf of the Myers Group of Companies. Uh, the Myers Group of Companies owns a number of properties within the area that's described as the Jean d'Arc Station area in the secondary plan, or what I like to refer to as the Uville District. Let me start by saying, you know, staff are to be commended for their efforts and that uh, at a very high level, um, our clients support the vision for the Jean d'Arc station area. Unfortunately though, as you've heard many times before, the, the devil is in the details. Uh, next slide, please. So, we have uh, submitted a, a letter to staff uh, we've, last week uh, commenting on uh, the technical uh, secondary plan that was circulated in August. Um, and we raised three general concerns with respect to the secondary plan. Th throughout the secondary plan, there are policies that require non-residential uses on the ground floor of all buildings where they abut any kind of a publicly accessible space. I, I believe that the, the second technical amendment before you today is, a, is an attempt to address this, but I can assure the members of the committee that there are more policies than the specific policy referenced in that amendment that deal with this issue. And the concern here is that the requirement could result in it being impossible to actually develop buildings while meeting the requirement of this policy. So like you've heard on the official plan and other documents, you know, the language is generally prescriptive. There's limited flexibility. And as much as like, as much as our clients would like to facilitate and implement the vision 
of the secondary plan, it may be impossible to do so given the wording of some of the specific policies in the secondary plan. Secondly, we've uh, raised some questions with respect to the policies related to privately owned public spaces. The policies are rather vague in terms of what, where, and how big those things should be. And I think it would be helpful to us. And quite frankly, I think it would be helpful to staff moving forward if the secondary plan provided great, better direction with respect to the public open spaces. And, and lastly, uh, there's very specific policies dealing with cost sharing for a new neighborhood park and a new public street that are proposed in the Jean d'Arc station area. And, and the policies require that the landowners enter into this cost sharing agreement before they can do anything. And the difficulty we have with these policies, we understand the purpose of them, but the difficulty we have is that you can only have an agreement if two parties are actually, or two or more parties are actually willing and motivated to enter into an agreement. And unlike in greenfield development, where you've got landowners with acres and acres of vacant land that they're anxious to develop and are motivated to enter into cost sharing agreements, we're in a totally different situation here where all these properties are currently developed, they're generating income for the landowners. They are not motivated to enter into any kind of a cost sharing agreement that's gonna cost them money. And so we need to think more carefully about how to structure any kind of agreement or how to deal with the funding for the new public street that's been identified in, this, in the Jean d'Arc station area and how to deal with any possible over dedications of parkland. Now, we're not gonna resolve this today. And we did meet with staff on Tuesday, but we weren't able to you know, go through the policies in detail. Next slide, please. So the ask of committee this morning is really quite simple. We'd ask that you direct staff to work with us to refine the language of the secondary plan to address the concerns that we've raised in our letter uh, before this matter rises to a council on September 21st. And I'll just further note that I only realized this morning that the secondary plan that's before you today for adoption is not the secondary plan that we commented on last week. Uh, there have been a number of changes made and those changes are itemized in document seven. I've taken the opportunity while you've been dealing with other items this morning to scan document seven. I found a number of typos in terms of references to various policies. I've even found a change that doesn't appear to be reflected in the secondary plan that's before you this morning for adoption. So I would ask committee to please direct staff to meet with us over the next two weeks, and which may lead to further uh, technical amendments being brought before council on September the 21st. I'm over my five minutes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Murray. Any questions from committee members for Murray? Okay, thanks for your presentation today. And I'm sure uh, some of those points will be raised with staff later on. Uh, fifth delegation is Brian Casagrande and Tyler Yakachuk from FOTEN. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Morning, Brian. Okay, sorry, just bear with me two seconds here. Um, so I'm uh, with with Foten Planning and Design. I'm presenting today on behalf of One Five Four Seven Seven Five Canada Limited. We we also provided a letter on their behalf yesterday, and our letter identified the following primary concerns with the secondary plan as drafted. Uh, the first is OP consistency. 
Um, now, the secondary plan is being considered and approved only months prior to when we expect that the city may see ministry approval on the new official plan, and it strikes us as unnecessary and inappropriate from a planning perspective to consider such an important city building document without first having the benefit of clear OP direction to ensure that that secondary plan will not end up being inconsistent with the OP shortly after approval. Secondly, um, the 10th the line station, if I can ask you to bring up my slide four um, that we prepared. My, my client's lands are outlined in blue and located on the north side of St. Joseph, just east of the 10th line station. And this also illustrates their proximity to the future 10th line station, which is shown in orange on this image. The station location is within 200 meters of the subject lands, and that's illustrated in Annex A of the secondary plan, which reflects the station location, which stems from a city-initiated study as recent as 2019. Now, conversely, Schedule A of the secondary plan shows a location on 10th that's near the highway crossing. That would still be less than 400 meters from my client's lands. And if I can ask slide three to be brought up. Now, while it would be appropriate to have this inconsistency clarify, what's most relevant to me is the fact that the area surrounding the future 10th line station appears to have been planned without consideration for this future station, which has been planned for many years and remains on Schedule A of the city's new official POP. The area surrounding the station exhibits the same merits for height and densities as other station areas and should be planned for building heights in the 40 story range. Now, I ask you to consider how this area differs from example from, for example, the Jean d'Arc station area that's shown at the western edge of this planning area just south of the highway. The 10th station area shown with the blue teardrop on this image is just as close to the station, would not sub supplant an existing established residential neighborhood, and are separated further and buffered with a forested area from the low rise residential area to the north, where shadowing and overlook impacts would normally be of primary concern. Now, the secondary plan rationale for taking this approach seems to be based on a lack of funding for this station area. In my view, this is not a valid planning approach, and it's inconsistent with the approach staff, committee, and council have consistently taken with other future station areas, such as those along Carling Avenue, that to my knowledge are also, are also not funded. The appropriate planning approach would rather to be introduced policies that are based on the plan for this future station. And if the plan for this area actually gets removed, uh, for a station in this area gets removed, the secondary plan would then need to change accordingly at that time. Uh, thirdly, demonstration planning, as it stands now, the subject lands are simply planned to maintain their existing height of six stories. Worse still, future development will be burdened with preparing a demonstration plan, amalgamating additional land holdings and analyzing servicing capacity. Such an approach is more common with larger land holdings that involve few landholders like Place d'Orleans that you can see on this image, which is one parcel compared to over 10 in the subject area near my client's lands. Such policies should be structured with policies that in my view incentivize demonstration planning and land assembly with additional height and density opportunities. Fourth, parks planning. Schedule C, which I don't have in my slide deck of the secondary plan, um, places a park symbol on the subject lands. The related policies appropriately state that the symbol does not denote a park location. However, in our experience dealing with this and other secondary plans, this can create future confusion for both developers and city development review staff. If the symbol is not meant to denote specific lands, then we would suggest the use of an overlay for the entire area on Schedule C instead. And finally, Finally, on slide six, you'll see a series of PPS policies that advocate for intensification surrounding rapid transit stations. At slide five, you will find goals and objectives that are within this secondary plan that appropriately respond to these policies, but that direction is not reflected in the, in the policy direction surrounding the 10th station. So in conclusion, we would ask the committee either direct staff to amend their policy directions surrounding the 10th station to reflect these concerns, or ideally direct them to consider and consult with FOTEN before returning to committee following final approval of the new official plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Any questions from committee members? I'm seeing none, thanks for your presentation today. 
and for the uh, correspondence received as well. And our final set of speakers are Robert or Robert and Suzanne Gibar. They have joined the room chair. You might just need to unmute. Looks like they're unmuted. Robert and Suzanne, are you there? We are not able to hear you, even though it looks like your mic is unmuted. All right, let's uh, let's do this. Maybe uh, we'll we'll move on with start our questions to staff. And if the clerk's office can um, can check with Robert and Suzanne and see if we can resolve that issue in the background. Um, I would actually like to go to uh, Councillor Luloff. He's got his hand up first. You're quick on the draw, Councillor. Um, over to you. Thanks uh, to the committee members for affording me the opportunity to speak uh, to this uh, this historic plan. Uh, this is uh, something that started off as uh, the possibility of a secondary plan uh, for uh, the Plaster Orleans area. And after a, uh, a, a conversation um, mid-council uh, mid meeting, one of my first council meetings, I walked over to Steve Willis and said, hey, listen, I think we're missing out on a really great opportunity here uh, to, to take advantage uh, of the economic development that will naturally come um, from the east extension of, uh, of the LRT. And he agreed immediately. And he put together an incredible team of planners. And I, and I can't say enough and, and heap enough praise on this group of planners, uh, you know, led uh, by, by Peter and Robin uh, throughout the course of the last three years. Uh, you've been thoughtful. Uh, you've, uh, you know, been very, uh, very open uh, to hearing uh, from the community. Some of the uh, tools uh, that you used uh, to engage with the community were novel. Uh, and I believe uh, that they really captured the sense of excitement uh, that that my community and I have uh, for what this plan will bring. One of the top things uh, that that I hear uh, in our community, and, and I believe that uh, Councillor Dudas will probably agree, is uh, what we hear is, uh, how come we don't have the same amenities on this side of the green belt uh, as they do in uh, areas like, uh, like uh, Councillor Curry's ward? Uh, you know, uh, we feel, have felt uh, that uh, perhaps uh, post-amalgamation that the east end of the city hasn't received the same sort of attention uh, as the west. Uh, and perhaps that's naturally because uh, we've been a, a bedroom community. Uh, but Orleans uh, can have nice things too. Uh, the BIA has, uh, has uh, had a, uh, a streetscape plan on the books for 12 years that didn't have the policy backing uh, from the city that was required uh, to achieve it. You saw today in some of the slides from the annexes what uh, this plan uh, is, is going to achieve for St. Joseph. It is incredible. A walkable, cyclable, safe, uh, pedestrian uh, um, space uh, that has been beautified with things uh, like trees, having all of our amenities up against uh, the uh, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure in a way that we couldn't even imagine uh, except through the BIA streetscape plan. I am utterly impressed with the renderings uh, that this team has put together uh, and the work that they've done consulting with the community and working uh, with me over the course of the last three years. This is uh, going to transform our main street and yes, change is difficult. But when all you hear is, why can't we bury the hydro lines? You know, why does St. Joseph still look like it's stuck in the 1960s? And I used to joke that, you know, having large sprawling parking lots up against your main street may have been nice in the 1950s when people, people were driving, you know, 1956 Plymouth, but I drive a 20, well, did until very recently, a 2013 Kia Rio. That's not going to be pulling anybody into your business. You know, let's get that parking underground or behind and make our street vibrant and accessible again. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to provide rentals uh, to, to seniors and people that want to, to downsize and want to stay in the community. They can walk to get their groceries. 
They can walk downstairs and get a coffee in the morning on their way uh, to get on the train to get to work if they're uh, if they have to go in. We would really like to see people continue to work for home or in the community, and we're going to be able to provide employment close to home. You'll be able to live, work, and play in the same neighborhood. This is a massive opportunity uh, for our East End. We're finally putting uh, Orleans on the map in a real way. Thank you uh, to Councillor Dudas uh, and to my council colleagues in the East, Councillor Kitts, Councillor Tierney, uh, for providing great advice throughout this and engagement and encouraging people to come out. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to, to this plan being implemented and to finally having a vibrant and livable street uh, in Orleans. The biggest problem that we have right now is that, you know, in order to access the business that's directly behind your home, you have to walk the equivalent of five city blocks just to get there. The new connectivity plan uh, that's included with this and further study will ensure that, that that is no longer the case and we'll finally have a livable Main Street in Orleans. It's such a wonderful thing. Thank you very much to everybody who played a part in it. Uh, Robin, you've uh, you've knocked it out of the park with this, you and your team. Truly, truly appreciate it. And while there are still some details to be worked out, I know that we'll get there and you'll continue uh, to consult as you have. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate the opportunity to address the committee today. Okay, thanks, Councillor. Uh, I just wanna check one more time if we have uh, Robert and Suzanne, uh, they've been able to join us and connect to the audio. I, I just, excuse me, promoted Robert again to see if uh, maybe we can, it'll work this time. Otherwise our staff is, is working with them. Okay. So I see Robert is in the panelist room. So Robert, if you can accept the prompt to unmute, we'll see if it works this time. So you've unmuted, but we still cannot hear you. So the clerk's office is going to try to call you and see if we can connect to you by phone, and we'll we'll check in a little later with Robert and Suzanne. Uh, so let's keep going on uh, questions for staff, Councillor Dudas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I I do have a question for staff, but I also wanted to to quickly make a comment. So I'll start with my question. I did want to uh, bring up what Mary Chown and the Myers Group had suggested um, in terms of a direction to staff. And I would like to propose that staff move forward with those discussions with those, those stakeholders in the weeks to come before this comes to council. I think that we've come a long way in understanding what the UVIL section will look like, but I would like to know if staff would be willing to undertake those discussions prior to this coming to council. I'm assuming that's a yes. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, we would be uh, pleased to work with Myers Group or any, uh, we would be pleased to follow the direction. Thank you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And I know, I, I have to say, I know that staff have been phenomenally engaged through this whole process. So I'm not surprised that they're willing to, to speak further with, with the stakeholder going forward. I wanted to say how important this plan is for the East End. And I want to thank my council colleague, particularly Councillor Luloff, as well as Councillor Kitts and Councillor Tierney, because this has been a project that has been decades in the making. And Councillor Luloff mentioned this a moment ago, but you know, oftentimes we in the East End look to other areas of our city, the South End and the West End, and we say, why can't we have this? Why can't we have a beautiful main street that is walkable, that we can cycle along, that I can take my kids and we can go from shop to shop and do, you know, our groceries at and, and have a, a croissant at and, and sit on a patio. Right now, the way that our main street, St. Joseph, the true heart of our community, is not that. It is absolutely an the antithesis to pedestrian friendly. It really deters people from wanting to be there. And that's not where we want to see our main streets be across the city, but particularly in the East End. And I want to actually, I, I 
so greatly appreciate the work staff have put into this. And I have to say, it was wonderful to see it. They weren't just working on this. They were inspired by this and they really put forward a vision. But I want to just say how important it was to have the public engaged. And, you know, Robin had mentioned it during his presentation. At that first meeting at Shankman, there was 300. We actually had to have an extra room set aside. We had to open up the floor so that we can fit all the people because people care so deeply about how these sections of the East End are going to be changing. And I loved the fact that this plan doesn't just take into account St. Joseph and the Boulevard. It actually takes into account the surrounding areas that will be changed over time and will evolve to accommodate all the economic benefits that the LRT extension is going to bring to us, the potential, potential zoning opportunities that we'll have, the potential for affordable housing, near transit, to have mixed use, to truly have the community that Orleans deserves. So I am very, very pleased to see this come forward today. I look forward to supporting it. I do want to see that consideration is given to transitions and setbacks because once again we know that we don't we don't know exactly what the next decade or couple of decades are going to hold so I want to have that continued conversation about the plan but I think that this is a phenomenal step in the right direction and I think that as I said this has been decades in the making it couldn't have been done if it wasn't for the phenomenal staff that have worked on it the public that engaged in it the businesses and the heart of Orleans BIA that have been involved in the conversations and truly my council colleagues. And I really do want to give a shout out to Councillor Luloff. He has been a phenomenal voice for this. And I can't wait to start seeing these improvements come with this plan. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks Councillor. Councillor Kitts. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do want to take a turn to cheerlead about this a little bit, but um, first I wanted to give staff an opportunity to comment on some of what the delegations touched on. I believe um, the issues that the Manals bro brought up um, is outside the scope of the secondary plan, so I just wanted to, to confirm that. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the uh, Menard uh, Menard property, uh, the EP zoning. So uh, this uh, the expropriation is entirely outside of the secondary plan. It is part of stage two. Uh, has uh, nothing to do with the secondary plan, and we had nothing uh, to do previously with the uh, previous expropriation, which is historical. Uh, I could go to uh, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Stowe to uh, describe a little bit about the the land conditions and why the lands uh, were put in uh, a green space designation in the new official plan. Thank you, Robin. Um, Mr. Chair, it would probably be helpful if I uh, shared um, some of our OP schedules from the current OP and the newly approved OP. Um, with your permission, I will attempt to do that. I'm not sure if you're able to. I'm not sure. Share screen. There we go. I will give it a try. If it doesn't work, then I'll just explain without. Uh, no, okay, I can't. So um, I'll just uh, I'll just describe it. So the um, uh, the Menard property in the current o official plan um, has a split uh, land use designation. It is split uh, urban natural feature and um, uh, employment area. However, the boundary between uh, the uh, urban natural feature and the employment area is approximate in the, in the old official plan. We did not have the same detailed uh, um, environmental data that we have now, um, particularly topographic data. And the schedules also, it, the old schedules are also in Corel Draw which were not geo-referenced, so any location information was always somewhat uh, approximate. That um, uncertainty was reflected in the DR zoning. Um, that DR zoning reflected the fact that, that we had not set any boundaries, uh, um, precise boundaries on where development could occur, what kinds of constraints might exist on the property and where those constraints might be. Uh, when we uh, worked on the new official plan, we were using new data. Um, and in particular, we had better data on the presence of significant woodlands on the property and on and topographic data that showed us where the top of the slope was on the property, 
plus um, we had good floodplain mapping for the property. And based upon that data, we revised the, uh, the boundary of the urban natural feature in the new official plan to include essentially all of the property, um, regarding it as, uh, as being almost entirely constrained by uh, these environmental factors. That boundary is in the new official plan in, in two schedules. It's in schedule B and it's in the uh, urban green space boundary. Um, those schedules have been approved by council as part of the, the new official plan. And to my knowledge, the, uh, the owners of the property, the Menards or their representatives have not made any, uh, did not make any submissions uh, or appear before planning committee or count, uh, planning committee um, uh, to speak to those changes when we made them. Okay, thank you very much. I just thought that was important uh, context since we heard that delegation. And then um, about the 10th the line station, because it's not funded, that's why there was not as much robust sort of planning around that station, is that correct? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would not characterize it as uh, not robust planning. Is that <laughs> we, have, we, have, uh, we have some specific policies uh, in the secondary plan. There's an area specific policy relating to that block. Uh, we did provide, uh, upon consultation with some of the landowners, including uh, Mr. Gabor, we, uh, whom we hope to hear from soon, uh, we did include a policy that suggested that if the uh, council were to decide not to build a, uh, a station there, uh, because we're not sure whether the funding will come, uh, it is a ghost. It is a, uh, we call it a ghost station, but it is a station yeah. in, in all of our in all of our master plans. So if the council decides not to uh, go forward with it officially, then the uh, we would revert to the uh, minor corridor designation, which is from the parent official plan for those lands. And we would contemplate a additional height and density associated with uh, with the site. I know all about ghost stations in Orleans South Navin, so I think that's a very prudent approach. Um, so I thank you, staff. I, I um, I'll attempt to be brief because my colleagues said a lot of what I wanted to say, but there is a reason why the East End councillors are so enthused about this, and I do want to touch on it. Um, you know, the, the corridor isn't located in my ward, um, but this is transformational for the East End. And approving this plan, I think, is a monumental moment for Orleans. My parents moved into one of the very first subdivisions. They watched it build all around them. I grew up a stone's throw from this corridor, so it, it really hits home for me. And it's going to completely revitalize St. Joseph Boulevard, which residents have been calling for for as long as I can remember. Um, and it's going to give the East End an opportunity to take our share of density near transit, provide affordable housing opportunities, finally be able to diversify our housing supply and create those 15 minute communities that have been lacking in this um, area of our city. So um, a planning committee meeting might feel a little bit unceremonious, but I really want to salute staff for their work on this. I think the team under Robin and Peter's leadership have been really visionary and creative and thinking outside the box to ensure that this area lives up to its potential. And with the advent of these LRT stations, this is such a unique opportunity that really must be seized. So I'm very proud to be at the table for this decision. And uh, I really look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues and the community on what will be um, a new and exciting chapter for Orleans. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Leeper. Uh, thanks. Uh, my first part-time jobs and, and, and full-time jobs in retail were on St. Joseph Boulevard. Um, trying to cycle uh, to uh, to work was uh, always a, a bit challenging. I've lived in close proximity to uh, uh, St. Joseph Boulevard. It's near and dear to my heart. And I, I love seeing uh, the vision that is being expounded. And we know that um, when the rubber hits the road and, and people start actually um, rebuilding streets, and when they start 
proposing developments that oftentimes, you know, opposition can uh, arise that you hadn't anticipated. And having this vision for St. Joseph Boulevard written into a secondary plan uh, is going to be critical to ensure that we, uh, we we get through that. So I'm really pleased that staff have the, the work uh, put into this in order to make sure that the policy support for what will probably be sometimes controversial developments and rebuilds uh, is is written down and uh, and defensible. Um, I only have one question. It, uh, I'm thinking back to the uh, technical motions that were uh, brought up at the beginning. And I'm sorry, I don't remember if it was one of the technical motions or maybe uh, Councillor Dudas brought a motion forward to delete section 4.15 in its entirety. Oh, uh, Councillor Moffin made that as a, as a technical motion. Um, I just, uh, Lita Clay in, in Orleans is, is always a concern. Um, can staff give me some color on removing 4.15 in its entirety? Does that, is that advisable? Thank you, uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, we did work very closely with uh, the, the uh, Rideau Valley Conservation Authority on the wording of that section. Originally, uh, we had some policies that were drafted actually prior to the, the new official plan. So we've been working on these uh, uh, marine clay policies in the secondary plan for about a year and a half, two years, just to make sure because it's an important consideration, especially in the East End. And we'd been listening during the new official plan. Uh, so uh, uh, the new official plan came forward. Uh, the new official plan has good policies relating to that. Uh, we'd uh, kept our draft policies in the secondary plan upon some further review with the conservation authority. We decided that uh, a specific policy wasn't necessary, that we would rather rely on the parent official plan policies. This means that the rules are the same for Lida Clay across the entirety of the city. The study requirements are the same, but okay. it, we did, but we kept the preamble because uh, a part of that, uh, part of that narrative is, is very important to include in the secondary plan that we felt. Okay, so 415 is not um, any additional layer of scrutiny on, on development to ensure um, and thus is redundant to what's already in the official plan? Uh, my, no, I don't believe it is, I, I wouldn't say redundant, but I believe it is uh, supportive, uh, supportive language of the policies and the parent plan. Okay. Um, let me touch base with you on that uh, uh, before council, just to uh, to. Uh, but I, I appreciate I'd be, I'd the reply. I'd be pleased to answer any questions on it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And congratulations, uh, congratulations, Matt, Laura, um, uh, Catherine. This is great. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, I have two quick questions. Um, one was just around that whole idea of uh, I think it was Mr. Casagrande who questioned whether or not we should even be doing this with an OP that hasn't been approved yet. Uh, can staff address that concern, please, whether it's appropriate at this time to bring forward secondary plans without an approved OP? Uh, certainly. I'd actually like to defer to the uh, Acting Director of Long Range Planning, uh, Mr. Uh, David Wise. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just as a process question, the recommendation that's before you right now is not in fact actually calling for enactment of the secondary plan now. What it is doing is it is uh, bringing forward the secondary plan for, uh, for uh, Planning Committee and Council's consideration. Uh, and then upon passage of the uh, new official plan by the province, when that approval comes through, uh, we would then bring the enacting bylaw for this uh, secondary plan through at that time. Uh, so we are simply just uh, seeking pre-approval uh, to be able to bring this document forward. Uh, and then that would be linked then to, uh, to the provincial direction for the approval. If Mr. Mark wants to chime in a little bit more, I'd be uh, happy to, uh, to have people's thoughts, but uh, that's the process that we're recommending. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, that's very helpful. Um, and I guess the last thing is um, the delegations from Novatech and FOTEN did raise a few concerns just about uh, they, they had discovered inconsistencies in the final text and I hope staff would be uh, open to any uh, feedback from those groups or others and if there are further technical amendments required before this comes to council, not significant content changes or policy changes, but any technical amendments, but there was one um, one in particular, the, the, I think Mr. Casagrande about the park designation symbols and Schedule C. Are staff aware of that concern? And is there a way to clarify that in the schedule documents? 
for you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we're aware of that concern. We spoke about it actually with a, a couple of different parties. The, uh, they're in, intended to, to be general. Uh, you'll see as well on the on the height schedule that there's a requirement for a demonstration plan on most of the, on, on, I think a number of those sites. The, the demonstration plan really looks carefully at the integration of those properties and the connectivity in the streets. Uh, so it would be expectation that that, that that would change, but we'll clarify the language prior to going to, to rising to council. Okay, thank you for that. And Councillor Leeper has another question. Yeah, thanks, Chair Gower. The um, Your question actually did raise another one with respect to uh, how we're going to implement some of the zoning that we anticipate coming out of the official plan. So if the official plan moves forward, we'll implement the um, uh, zoning bylaw that would implement the secondary plan. Uh, would it be the intention then through the comprehensive zoning bylaw review to update the zoning to match the secondary plan? Or do we anticipate that these would continue to be um, one-off uh, one-off zoning applications because that approach obviously has has not been working for us uh through you mr chair i defer to uh the director of long-range planning who is uh, managing that file and thank you mr chair uh the, the councillor is correct that that was something that we would be looking at as consistency exercise through the new zoning bylaw process so we'd be looking at these secondary plan directions and amending the zoning accordingly okay great um yeah, that's exactly what I was hoping to hear. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for staff? All right, I'm seeing none. Um, I'll check with uh, Kelly. Were, the, uh, were Robert and Suzanne able to connect by phone that you're aware of? No, Chair, I, uh, I haven't. Um, mm -hmm. I've reached out, but I haven't heard, so. I see they are still here on the screen. They're unmuted, but let's try one more time if we can hear Robert or Suzanne. I don't think the audio is working. Robert and Suzanne, if you can hear me, we have, I think, two or three weeks before this goes to council. So if you do have comments that you would like the committee and council to review, you can submit those to the clerk in writing and uh, they'll be circulated to all members of council. And we would like to hear from you and uh, we'll be able to address those any concerns. Councillor Luloff? Thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gibord uh, is, a, is an important stakeholder along this corridor, and I definitely want to make sure um, that what he has to say uh, is captured. So I really appreciate that opportunity. Yeah, and we apologize for the difficulty in uh, connecting today, but hope we can hear from you uh, before this comes to council. Okay, so let's go through the motions. Um, we have four motions, so we'll go through each one and uh, see if the committee is willing to carry them. The first one was a technical motion on sensitive marine clays. Is that motion carried? Carried. Carried, okay. The second motion was on the station core. Is that motion carried? Carried. Carried. Okay, the third motion was document three maximum heights. Is that motion carried? Carried. Carried. Okay, and the fourth motion was Councillor Dudas's motion on transitions. Is that motion carried? Carried. 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 Okay, and then the final report recommendations as amended, are they carried? Carried. 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 Okay, well, congratulations to everyone, to staff, to councillors, and again, thank you to all stakeholders and public members who were involved in this. A great example of how public input and consul public consultation makes for a, an excellent overall plan. So well done, and we'll look forward to this coming to council in a few weeks. I think that was our last item, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, no, it was not. Uh, I don't think we have any in-camera items, but we do have a motion of which notice has been previously given from Councillor Dudas on step backs within the Innis Road zoning review area. So let's uh, bring that motion up on the screen if we can. And Councillor Dudas, I know you read this into the record last time. If you want to introduce it for us and we'll go from there. Absolutely. I'll just wait for it to come up on screen. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'll quickly speak to this and then I'll read the therefore be resolved. What this uh, kind of was was driven by was that um, a past 
work by city staff actually back in 2013, 2014, had bundled a number of properties in the Blackburn Hamlet community and defined them and, and set them as AM11 zoning. And what we have discovered is, is that some of those subzones are not applicable to the sites as they are as they stand at the moment. What this attempts to do is to have these sites re-examined as part of the zoning review, the bylaw zoning review, to ensure that they actually fit the characteristics of the community, still allowed for density, but allow for the setbacks, the stepbacks, and the, tradition, the transitions that are required um, and befitting these sites. And I will give an example. One of the sites that I'm particularly talking about is adjacent to a one-story school. So it's a lot of one stories. And what is in the AM11 zoning allows for a nine story next to some of these with absolutely no setbacks or, or step backs um, laid out within the framework. So if I could have the, I'm just trying to see if I could see the therefore be resolved because I had introduced this last time. That, okay, um, I'll read this. That the planning committee recommend council approve that staff be directed to investigate amending the zoning bylaw in the next omnibus amendment so that the step backs within the Innis Road zoning review area, document one, are applied to both the rear and side yards where development abuts low rise residential zones, property subject to an active planning application will be exempt from these changes to re-examine the appropriateness of the AM11 subzone within the Innis Road Zoning Review Area as part of the new zoning bylaw project as concerns related to the building height and compatibility with the surrounding community remain. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Any, uh, any questions or comments from councillors on this? I just want to check with uh, staff, I guess with Mr. Wise, that uh, this fits will fit within the... Uh, the work plan and review as it's planned right now? Yes, uh, Chair, uh, we don't have any concerns with this motion. Staff would be reviewing the appropriate of transitions and setbacks regardless. So we take this as a, as a as positive direction. Okay, then on uh, Councillor Dudas's motion, is it carried? Carried. Carried. Carried, thank you. Okay, are there any notices of motion for a subsequent meeting? Are there any inquiries? I have one item other, under other business, and it's a quick thank you to Jordan Moffat from my team, who's going to be leaving the city uh, in the next week or so. Jordan's heading back to the private sector. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for all of your help over the last couple of years. Jordan's the person who helps me get prepared for this meeting and uh, working alongside the clerk's office and other staff, and one of the many people who help these meetings go smoothly. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for all your advice and help on our local ward files and our citywide files as well. So thank you and good luck with uh, your next adventure. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Our next meeting is Thursday, September 22nd. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.